we will continue with the membranes we were talking about uh, pervoperation let me go slightly more in detail on pervoperation pervoperation is also a membrane process it is a combination of uh, permeation and ev evaporation that means uh, the liquid changes into a vapor phase it gets permeated through the membrane material and then on the other side it gets uh, again condensed into a liquid this is a typical flow sheet of a pervoperation process so you have a feed it is a liquid feed it gets uh, vaporized in a heater and then it comes in contact with the membrane the membrane could be a hydrophilic or a hydrophobic membrane that means hydrophilic membranes will be used if you are wanting to pull out water from a broth especially in ma manufacture of say concentrated fruit juices or concentrated syrups you, you do not want any water present inside or you can have a hydrophobic membrane that means if you are interested in separating out uh, um, hydrophobic uh, hydrocarbons or solvents then uh, this type of uh, membranes are used. So, the membrane could be a hydrophilic or a hydrophobic once the feed is vaporized it gets uh, dissolved inside the membrane and then uh, there is a diffusion taking place and on the other side the vapor comes out and gets condensed into the liquid. Now, what is the there is a driving force here you are using a vacuum so that the vapor travels through the membrane. So, you can use pervoperation for concentrating um, fruit juices for concentrating even uh, say ethanol to almost 100 percent and uh, removal of solvents and so on actually. Many advantages are there it requires low temperature and pressure because you are using a vacuum and you just need to put in some heat so that uh, the liquid is vaporized. So, obviously the temperature of operation is very very low. So, it can be used for temperature sensitive material the energy usage is less. So, these are the advantages. Now, it is very good for for separating out uh, isotropic uh, mixtures you know what is isotrope isotrope is called a constant boiling system for example, ethanol water is a typical isotrope. So, you cannot purify 200 percent ethanol and um, so normally what uh, people used to do in the past uh, 100 years they used to add an entrainer which will break the isotrope then they will distill out remove the water then again they will distill um, to remove the entrainer from the water and the entrainer is recycled back. So, it will be a series of uh, distillation column and um, you are adding an entrainer and so on uh, it cannot be done for a if you want to purify fruit juices because uh, uh, you are talking about uh, a food product. So, in such situations per operation is very good because it will separate the liquid very efficiently it is very economical for dehydration of organic solvents that means I want to completely remove all the water present in solvent. So, what else can I do I may use a distillation that is energy intensive and sometimes you might not be able to get 100 percent uh, dehydrated solvent. So, uh, what else can you do you can add some adsorbent which will adsorb water or moisture then you have to filter out that adsorbent and then the adsorbent have to be heated again so that it gets regenerated and ready for further processing ok. So, it is going to be 2 or 3 steps you will be adding an adsorbent like a silica gel or alumina or zeolite it will adsorb all the water present in a solvent and then you will do a filtration. Now, this silica gel or alumina will contain water so you may have to take it to a heater and heat it. So, the water gets vaporized the silica gel is again available you can take it back again for adsorption. So, you see there are so many extra steps it is going to add to the cost whereas, pervoperation is going to be very economical for dehydrating organic solvents all you are going to use is a vacuum pump and little bit of heating so that the liquid gets vaporized. So, we can also use it for organics from aqua stream. So, like if you are using a hydrophobic uh, membrane and if the concentration of organic present in aqueous is very small then the organics can be removed from aqua stream especially you are talking about uh, um, waste water you want to remove some traces amount of organics. So, that the water can be used for other purposes ok then pervoperation is very good. 
you do not require N trainer, so there is no contamination. I talked about N trainer in azeotropic distillation. So, uh, there is no contamination especially in uh, pharmaceutical products or food and healthcare products. It is independent of vapor liquid equilibrium. I hope you all know what is vapor liquid equilibrium, you know it is a most important uh, principle on which distillation columns are based on. Okay. So, distillation separation of uh, two or three or multi component liquids happen because of this vapor liquid equilibrium. So, a liquid which has low boiling point um, will have more vapor present in the gas phase a liquid which, which has higher boiling point will um, will have less vapor present in the gas phase. So, because of this uh, vapor liquid equilibrium you are able to separate out in the vapor phase the low boiling component and the uh, in the liquid phase the high boil boiling component that is what is called vapor liquid equilibrium. You are not bothered about vapor liquid equilibrium here because the process is permeation and evaporation. So, vapor liquid equilibrium does not come into picture here. It can be con performed in batch or continuous mode that means, we can do this operation uh, in a batch mode or continuously you may pass uh, a mixture and continuously you may be purifying the mixture. It is very suited for heat sensitive products you know food or pharmaceutical products. So, because uh, as I mentioned in point number 1 we are not going to heat it. So, there is no question of uh, denaturization or formation of tar or caramel and so on actually. So, it is very good for food products and also for pharmaceutical products because you are not going to deactivate if there are any proteins present you are not going to deactivate it here. So, the liquid movement here is by the solution diffusion model. So, higher flux or higher movement of the solute can be obtained with an increased thermal motion of the polymer change and the diffusing species. Okay. So, if the diffusion coefficient of the diffusing species is high it can travel faster through the membrane okay. and if the polymer uh, on which the membrane is made up of if it is got better mobility then the diffusion of the solute is also going to be very good. So, the polymer on which the um, membrane pervaporation membrane is made up of has a very strong effect on the process diffusion process. So, the polymer backbone makes a lot of difference, the degree of cross linking of the polymer makes a lot of difference, porosity makes a lot of difference. So, there is a molecular level interaction between the membrane polymer and the diffusing species. Okay. So, you can describe this interaction in terms of Arrhenius equation, you must have all heard about Arrhenius equation long time back right. Arrhenius equation comes in kinetics. Um, the the kinetic rate constant is a function of temperature and the activation energy and that is where we might have studied Arrhenius equation. Here too Arrhenius equation comes into play. There is another theory it is called solution diffusion theory which is proposed by Graham on which uh, pervaporation system can be modeled or described. So, there is a gas permea permeation through a homogeneous membrane this permeation is made up of three fundamental basic steps. Okay. So, the solute is permeating through a membrane. So, there are three things that is going to be happening. So, solution of gas molecules in the upstream surface of the membrane. So, initially you have the solution of liquid which goes into gas and that gas molecule is in come in contact with the membrane surface in the upstream. Then you are going to have a diffusion of this dissolved species or solute through the membrane that is the diffusion. And the third step is the desorption of this dissolved species back into the downstream phase of the membrane. So, it will be a desorption of the dissolved species as a vapor and then in the condenser this vapor is condensed into liquid. So, these three things are happening. So, you are going to have the gas molecules going into solution in the membrane diffusion of the gas molecules through the membrane and finally, the desorption of this dissolved species back into the vapor phase. So, all these parameters affect this pervaporation process and that is what uh, Graham has proposed and that is why he calls it as solution diffusion theory. So, 
in perma operation there is always a change of phase ok. So, initially you have the liquid then goes into vapor this way then after diffusion this vapor again goes back into liquid. So, uh, there is a change of phase it is very useful for acetropic mixtures. You can also use carrier gas instead of putting vacuum on the downstream we can use carrier gas. So, the carrier gas can sweep the vapor that is diffusing out of the membrane ok. So, the separation is due to differences in the solubility and diffusion of the species of the membrane. So, if uh, some species diffuses very fast then uh, it will be collected faster on that downstream if there is another species which is very slow it will take much longer for it to be collected on the downstream. You need to of course, supply heat that is called the vapor, heat of vaporization for converting the liquid into a gaseous phase ok this is obvious. Now, um, the diffusion of this species through the membrane is also proportional to the size of this uh, species ok. Uh, this picture just gives you an idea about the kinetic diameters of uh, various uh, um, hydrocarbons depending upon the carbon number the kinetic diameter keeps increasing as you can see water is very very low um, kinetic diameter is very small because it does not have any carbon of course. Then you have methanol, ethanol, isopropanol, THF, pyridine, hexane, paraxylene and so on. So, you see the kinetic diameter increases from almost uh, 2.5 to 7. So, the diffusion of these species um, is a function of the kinetic diameter. So, a species like paraxylene um, as against isopropanol will be diffusing very very slowly because of the size. Yeah, ethanol will be diffusing, diffusing much slower than methanol because the kinetic diameters are different ok. Now, this is a very interesting book. Um, and it gives quite a lot of information about uh, membrane pervoperation it is a review. So, some of these studies uh, which I am talking about um, are collected from this uh, book and if one is interested to know more about uh, pervoperation uh, and polymers and the science and the principles one can look into this uh, reference ok. So, when you have pervoperation um, there is a thermodynamic equilibrium between the membrane and the feed. Um, so, we can put in a partition coefficient like your uh, solvent extraction. So, you will have a partition coefficient k which is given by C m by C feed. C m is the concentration of the species or solute in the membrane surface, C feed is the concentration in the feed and k is of course, the partition coefficient between the membrane and the feed phases correct. Now, membrane transport is a rate controlling process and it is given by fixed law of diffusion. We all know what is fixed law of diffusion. Fixed law of diffusion um, um, connects the flux with the, the driving force that is the concentration gradient and the diffusion coefficient correct. So, this is the fixed law of diffusion the permeation flux is equal to minus diffusion coefficient d c by d delta that means, uh, this is the driving force. Um, and this is the distance. Now, there is a minus term here because concentration will be going down you the driving force is the concentration gradient. So, you are moving the solute from a higher concentration to lower concentration that is why you have a minus term. So, you can little bit uh, simplify it and then uh, we can put it as delta c here and uh, this distance um, between uh, the species can be called delta we can bring in the partition coefficient also inside. So, we will end up having an equation like the flux is equal to d k by delta into delta c this is the driving force and this is the property of the membrane. So, if you look under the property of the membrane you will see terms like diffusion coefficient that is diffusion coefficient of the species through the membrane which is a function of the species as well as the membrane delta is like the thickness of the membrane and k is the partition coefficient that means, ratio of uh, the concentration um, that is just dissolved in the upstream 
vis a vis the concentration in the feed. So, these are the properties of the membrane and this is the driving force that is the flux. Okay. Now, we mentioned that uh, it is a function of uh, Arrhenius equation. So, we have uh, the permeability and uh, exponent raised to the power E p by R t, E p is the activation energy, R is the Gans constant and T is the temperature. So, P 0 is the permeability constant. Molecular flux, so the solute is uh, diffusing in and reaching the other side. So, there is a flux created by each solute. Okay. So, the amount of component permeated per unit area per unit time is given by Q divided by A okay, into T. A is the effective membrane surface area, T is your time. We have put i here because we are talking about i species. There could be a j species, k species, and so on. Actually, so each species will have certain flux. So j i the flux depends upon the moles of component i divided by a t. Now there is some other term which is called perm selectivity. So suppose you have two species i and j. What is the selectivity of the membrane for species i as against the species j? That's what is called perm selectivity. Okay. So, how do you define it? We have V i p divided by V j p divided by V i f divided by V j f. Okay. So, the i and j represents individual species or components, p represents the permeate and f represents the feed. Okay. So, alpha that is the perm selectivity is a function of the, the permeate to the feed okay, of the volume actually. So, industrial applications of pervaporation are now becoming larger and larger. It is uh, it's been realized that it has got a lot of advantages. So, there are large scale installations of pervaporation. So, we can use it for treatment of waste water, contaminant with organic I am just interested in removing some amount of uh, organic present, not large amount of organic, only very small amount of organic contamination is there and I want to remove it. So, pollution control, recovery of organic compounds from process side stream, sometimes uh, um, I am doing a reaction, there could be an organic contamination. So, I just want to remove that, so that I can recycle the process stream. Separation, purification of 99.5 percent pure ethanol from ethanol water systems harvesting of organic substances from fermentation broth. So, um, quite a lot of applications of uh, pervaporations are coming into the market. Now, as I mentioned you can do it in batch mode or in the continuous mode. So, obviously, the batch mode of pervaporation is uh, very very simple high flexibility. So, I can use the um, same setup for different types of components and so on. But you will require a buffer tank. So, you will require you will have a feed tank and um, into which uh, your feed may come in, then you will have the pervaporation system and the product has to be collected in another tank. So, you need a buffer tank. In a continuous process, you will be using less energy. Why? In a batch process, I will be heating, I will complete the pervaporation, I will stop the entire pervaporation, I will charge another lot of material. So, you are heating and cooling, heating and cooling. So, the energy consumption is much higher, whereas uh, in a continuous process you are continuously passing in the hot uh, stream. So, you do not have to heat, cool, heat, cool and so on actually. So, obviously, it will consume less energy. It is very good for low impurities in the feed. So, I want to remove only small amount of impurity um, and I have large quantity of the stream. So, in that case it is very very good. So, it is best for large capacity. Uh, so, large quantity of a stream needs to be processed and it has got very little amount of impurity which needs to be removed using this concept. So, nowadays uh, this type of uh, pervaporation is being preferred even for in distillation columns, especially if you have distillation columns uh, uh, systems where you are talking about dissolved solids and so on. So, we will talk about uh, how pervaporation can be used in distillation column later in this particular course itself. Okay. 
Now, membranes, let us look at membranes. So, as I said you have two types of membranes, hydrophilic membranes, organophilic or lipophilic membrane okay, or hydrophobic membranes. Hydrophilic membranes are very good for removing water from organic so solutions. That means, the amount of water present in a mixture of organic solvent is very little. So, I am interested in only removing that water. So, obviously, you have to have membranes which are water loving or hydrophilic. So, polyvinyl alcohol type of membrane, okay, polyvinyl acetate and so on. So, these membranes should have uh, glass transition temperatures above room temperature. So, you, the membranes will have glass transition temperatures above room temperatures. Organophilic membranes on the contrary, they allow hydrophobic material. So, obviously, this is very good for recovering organics from aqueous solution. So, I have a very long aqueous stream and there is some organic contaminant. So, I want to remove only that. In that situation, I need to use organophilic membranes. So, these are very good elastomer type of material, polymers with glass transition temperatures below room temperature. And of course, you should have membrane bit flexible also, because then organics can pass through like nitrile, butadiene rubber, styrene butadiene rubber and so on actually. So, the organic material can pass through. So, two types of uh, membranes depending upon what you want to remove. Do I want to remove little bit of water present in a large amount of organic uh, solvent or do I want to remove little bit of organic solvent in present in a large amount of aqueous stream. Now, pervaporation can also be used in distillation as I mentioned before. You can use it uh, for separating water from a solvent. Okay. The solvent could be heavy solvent like chloroform or it could be a light solvent. So, both types of uh, situations um, we can handle uh, per operation. Otherwise, you may have to resort to say um, yeah, azeotropic distillation. Okay. So, let us look at a uh, aqueous light solvent system like this you know. So, you have the distillation column you are introducing the feed here and then this is the boiler um, the boiler material is being heated up and it is fed up. Now, if it is an azeotrope obviously, you will have a constant boiling system then you will be in trouble and as I mentioned before you may have to add an entrainer. So, instead of that if you pass it uh, through a per operation system. So, the light solvent can be removed in the per operation membrane and uh, water can come down okay, and again come down through the column. So, the light solvent all the time rises and then in the membrane you will have something like a um, hydrophobic membrane and uh, it will separate out the solvent. So, the water will come back. Otherwise, if you are resorting to um, the normal conventional method of breaking acetrope, we may have to add an entrainer then uh, again distill then the entrainer has to be removed. So, again distilled. So, you will resort to two or three distillation columns. If it is a heavy solvent, the solvent will be in the down and water will be in the up right. So, if it is an heavy solvent, then what do you do? The solvent will be collected pure. In the top, you are going to have solvent and water. Again, uh, you will have a per operation membrane water alone can be recovered that means, you, I use a hydrophilic membrane here and then the solvent which is coming out can be again either mixed with the feed or you can dispose it off. So, this type of system is very good for heavy solvents. So, the solvent will be collected at the bottoms. This type of system is very good for light solvents where the solvent is collected at the top and water is collected at the bottom. So, imagine in a normal solvent azeotropic distillation, we may require two or three distillation columns, whereas here we are talking about one column and a one mem per operation membrane system. So, you are talking about using less equipment, you are talking about uh, using less energy, that is why it is becoming quite uh, useful to have. There is uh, another 
principle which we need to now introduce that is called isoelectric focusing. Now, you might have read that uh, proteins have charge ok. Why proteins have charge? Because proteins contain acid group, they contain uh, amino group. So, you are going to have charge. Okay. Now, the isoelectric point is the value of the pH at which the charge on the molecule is 0. Okay. So, we sometimes use this particular principle in even in 2D electrophoresis also. So, um, we, we separate based on isoelectric pH. Okay. So, we have a pH gradient and uh, each protein uh, will move and it will stop when it reaches the isoelectric pH. Okay. Now, all proteins, enzymes, peptides they will all have amino acids, the amino acids will have both uh, types of uh, positive and negative. So, you can have positive or negative type of uh, um, proteins actually. So, in isoelectric focusing uh, what do we do? We have uh, um, the change in pH and um, at one particular pH when the protein uh, charge is 0, it will not uh, further migrate or travel. So, this principle can be used also for separating out proteins of various isoelectric point. Okay. Now, consider a very simple system, I have 3 proteins and a protein A has an isoelectric pH at 7, protein B has an isoelectric pH at 6 and protein C has an isoelectric pH as 5. So, this is 5 and B has 6 and 7. Imagine I have a mixtures of all these 3 proteins and I am feeding at a pH of 6. So, this protein B will not have any charge that means, it will be neutral in this particular pH whereas, the other 2 proteins of course, will have charge because they are not in the isoelectric point. So, if I, if I apply a large voltage protein A and C will be moving agreed whereas, protein B will not be moving. So, imagine I have a 3 chamber and um, I am feeding the mixture of protein at a pH of 6 B will not move B will just travel down. So, I will get a stream very concentrated in B, but on the contrary suppose I have another chamber where I am passing a buffer of pH equal to 5 and another chamber in which I am passing a buffer of pH is equal to 7. Uh, the protein A will move to this isoelectric its isoelectric pH and uh, protein uh, C will move to its isoelectric pH. So, this chamber will be predominantly A, this chamber will be predominantly C and this chamber will be predominantly B. So, this type of uh, separations based on isoelectric pH can also be achieved. So, the separating chambers are made up of membranes. Okay. So, these membranes will allow these proteins to migrate towards this isoelectric pH. Okay. So, this is another way of separating out uh, proteins um, having different isoelectric pH. But this is not a very uh, popular type of uh, large scale separation process, you know. but uh, it can be used in a small scale in laboratory uh, settings. But the main principle here is based on isoelectric pH, proteins um, with the charge becomes neutral at its isoelectric pH. So, when they have charges by when I apply a voltage they will be migrating until it reaches its isoelectric pH. So, proteins will be located in their respective isoelectric pH and that principle is used in this type of separations. So, each uh, protein has a different isoelectric pH. In fact, this table tells you that look at gelatin you know it is got a very high molecular weight material its pH is 4.8 to 4.85. Insulin 5.3 to 5.35, cytochrome C 9.7, myoglobin 7, urease 5 to 5.1, hemoglobin 
6.79 to 6.83. So, we see a difference in their isoelectric pH. So, I should be able to make use of these differences in separating out. Of course, uh, you need to keep in mind uh, if the differences are very small, you might not be able to really achieve such fantastic separations. If the differences in isoelectric pH are large, then I may be able to achieve uh, the separations very efficiently or effectively. So, you need to keep uh, that particular point in mind actually. Okay. Look at the difference in molecular weights of these uh, material you know gelatin very large molecular weight myoglobin 17000, cytochrome c 15000 Dalton. Okay. So, the molecular weight differences are pretty high. Now, the problems are there in isoelectric focusing. Okay. There is always going to be remixing of purified materials with semi purified materials or crude starting materials. So, um, there is always going to be that. There is going to be heat generated quite a lot because you are applying a large voltage. So, heat is getting generated. So, you need to cool it otherwise the heat generated may denature your protein that is a point you need to keep in mind. You know. Membrane bioreactors that means, a combination of a bioreactor with the membrane. So, what are the advantages? I can use the membrane for separation, the bioreactor for the bioreaction and I can combine membrane and bioreactor together. So, it is like telescoping, I just have one system which will do the sub reaction come separation. So, I will not require a reactor, I will not require a separator separately. Okay. So, let us look at a membrane bioreactor. So, I have a reactor, I do the reaction and then I go through a, a membrane setup. So, there is a permeation taking place and the remaining material which is not permeating through is fed back into the reactor. Where do I use this? I can use this for suppose I am doing a biotransformation and I am having whole cells or enzymes in the reactor. I want to retain the enzyme or the bio biological molecule like bacteria or fungi, but I want to remove only the metabolites products. So, what I can do? I can do the reaction continuously, I can pass it through the uh, membrane system. So, the small molecule or metabolite will permeate through, then I can recycle the enzyme back. Okay. So, I can do this operation continuously. Where do I use this? For example, I have a fermentation where I am producing um, alcohols like ethanol or butanol. Now, they are not the microorganisms are not very tolerant beyond a particular concentration. So, in a normal conventional fermentation we just stop the reaction, but if I have a membrane I can continuously remove part of the alcohol that is produced and the remaining active biomass can be sent back. So, the advantage is the concentration of the alcohol will be much lower all the time in your reactor. So, that is the main advantage of this type of setup actually. So, continuously I remove the alcohol that is produced. So, the concentration of alcohol in the reaction media is very small. So, I can be rest assured that the microorganism or enzyme is not going to get denatured um, because of the build up of the alcohol. So, I am not allowing the alcohol to build up that is one design. Another design I can have the membrane itself as a active catalyst. That means, I can immobilize my enzyme in the membrane. Suppose, I am doing a biotransformation using enzyme um, instead of immobilizing it on a, a glass bead or encapsulating it on alginate or, or so on. I can uh, encap, uh, immobilize it on membrane itself. So, the feed when it comes in contact with the membrane which contains my enzyme catalyst, it will get reacted and the product will permeate through and go out. Okay. So, the enzyme itself is immobilized on the membrane material. So, the advantage is I do not have to have a separate filtration unit for uh, um, filtering my enzyme and again putting it back into my bioreactor and so on. So, I can avoid the second operation of filtration that is the advantage of uh, the combination of uh, um, 
membrane bioreactor here. So, the first uh, design we saw uh, where we are continuously removing a metabolite or a product, so that you do not allow it to uh, build up. If you allow it to build up, you may be denaturing your bacteria or fungus or enzyme. The second design is you are immobilizing your enzyme itself, so that the membrane becomes a active catalyst and the product is removed continuously as a permeate here. So, these are the two different designs by which uh, I can achieve tremendous flexibility with the help of a membrane into the bioreactor technology. So, both are alternate. So, I can have as the first one I can have a traditional stirred tank reactor and then I can have a membrane separation unit. In the second one uh, the membrane acts as a support for the catalyst catalyst is your enzyme or active cell okay. and then separation also automatically happens because it is immobilized on a membrane. So, your metabolite may be just diffusing through or permeating through. So, by choosing your membrane we can achieve this type of permeation or diffusion or filtration type of process. So, the bio catalyst can be flushed along a membrane module it can be segregated with the membrane module, can be immobilized in or on the membrane by entrapment, gel, jellification or physical adsorption or ionic binding, covalent binding or cross linking. So, all these can be achieved and uh, you will have the membrane acting as a support or immobilizing support. So, what are the advantages? We can increase reactor stability, we can increase productivity we can have improved product purity and quality, we can have reduction in waste, the product can be continuously removed. So, if the product is uh, toxic to the biological molecule or it is an inhibitor to the biological molecule by continuously removing it, we are, we are preventing its accumulation. So, the efficiency of the overall system will depend upon the biochemical that is the catalyst activity, reaction kinetics, concentration, viscosity of the substances, product, immobilization stability. How, how stable is this enzyme when it is immobilized on your membrane? That is a very important point to consider because enzyme may lose its activity when you are trying to immobilize it on the support. The geometric parameters, the membrane configuration, is it a flat plate, it is a tubular uh, and so on, the morphology and also the pore size distribution. Then of course, the hydrodynamic parameters such as the, the pressure, the flow, the velocity. So, all these parameters come into picture. So, the overall efficiency of this type of uh, immobilized systems will be biochemical related, geometry related and hydrodynamic related. So, they are used in a hollow fiber configuration, you can have a hollow fiber and uh, your enzyme could be immobilized inside of the uh, tubes. Uh, so, we can have a very high packing density that means, large surface area per unit volume. They have been already being used in uh, production of bio amino acids, antibiotics, anti inflammatory compounds, anti cancer drugs, vitamins optically pure enantiomers and so on actually. So, lot of applications are slowly coming up in the market and um, I think uh, it is because of its advantages they will be replacing quite a lot of the conventional uh, reactor followed by separators actually. So, there are examples of synthesis of lovastatin with the mobilized candida rugosa lipase on a nylon support, production of uh, liltiasm chiral intermediate using a multi-phase enzyme bioreactors, synthesis of certain oligosaccharides and oligodextrans in a recycled membrane bioreactor, production of derivative of uh, analgesic ketorphin using a alpha chemotrypsin as catalyst and alpha alumina mesoporous tubular support as membrane, biodegradation of a high strength phenol solutions using pseudomonas putida using a microporous hollows fiber membrane. So, a lot of applications are already being uh, um, investigated. Another area where uh, membranes have come into being, uh, it I would call it a much more recent is the membrane chromatography unlike the normal 
solution based uh, chromatography ok. So, membrane chromatography it is an alternate to conventional resin based chromatography you know. So, the what are the benefits It's shorter diffusion time when compared to resin based chromatography because the interaction between molecules and active sites on the membrane is through convection that means flow. Whereas, in a normal chromatography there is a stagnant fluid inside the pores of a adsorbent material, material or particle. So, the diffusion coefficients are much slower. So, the diffusion times are much larger. So, adsorptive membranes they have the potential to maintain high efficiencies because you can use high flow rates, we can use it for large biomolecules with small diffusion coefficient. So, by doing uh, this uh, short diffusion times we are preventing the protein degradation or even denaturization of the proteins. So, it is ideal for biological molecules. So, you have stacked membranes, we have hollow fiber membranes, you can have spiral wound membranes uh, for membrane chromatography. In a normal absorptive mechanism, you may have ion exchange, hydrophobic, reverse phase, affinity based procedures. So, we can use all these procedures for adsorption of the active ingredient on top of the membrane material ok. So, you have the active ingredient um, sort of immobilized on the membrane material and this type of immobilization can be achieved through different mechanisms ion exchange, hydrophobic, reverse phase, affinity based uh, procedures actually. So, ion exchange membranes they will be strongly acidic groups like sulfonic acid or it can be strongly basic groups like uh, quaternary ammonium, it could be weakly acidic like carboxylic acid or weakly basic like di diethyl amine types actually. You can also have affinity membrane, so you will have um, ligands such as amino affinity ligands, protein A and G, low molecular mass ligands like uh, sibacron blue, histidine tryptophan and other ligands like copper 2 plus and so on. So, we can also have affinity uh, ligands immobilized on uh, membrane. So, we will get a affinity membrane type of systems. So, what type of membranes we can use cellulose based material, polysulfone based material, polyamide based material, hydrocid. We can also have composite membranes you know such as blends of polyether sulfone polyethylene oxide coated on all surfaces with covalently bound layer of hydroxy ethyl cellulose. So, we can have different types of membrane surfaces polymeric natural materials hydrophilic as well as the hydrophobic. So, commercial membranes flat sheet systems this is a company which is manufacturing that we can have stacks of membranes several company in Europe and US radial flow cartridges hollow fiber modules. So, uh, different uh, morphologies or different uh, systems and different companies uh, which manufacture these uh, commercial membranes. So, how does a membrane chromatography and gel based chromatography look like? We are all familiar with the gel based or the liquid chromatography. So, you have a particle particle is nothing but a support, then we will have the ligand molecules here and then we have the solute which will get uh, in contact with the ligand. So, you are going to have film diffusions, you are going to have pore diffusion and then you have the binding kinetics. Whereas, in a membrane system if you see you will have the membrane and then you have the ligands attached to the membrane ok. So, here we do not have pore diffusion coming into picture. So, you will have Philip diffusion as well as the binding kinetics. So, you are getting rid of the pore diffusion. So, that is uh, one of the main advantages of this. So, diffusion times will be much smaller, much shorter. So, a lot of examples have been uh, quoted where membrane chromatography has been used um, vis a vis the conventional liquid phase uh, chromatography. So, membrane chromatographies have been reported for compounds such as proteins like monoclonal antibody, serum antibody, serum albumin, enzymes or DNAs and viruses and so on actually. Of course, they have still not come into large scale uh, commercial operation, but uh, they are still in the lab, but they seem to have 
quite a good advantage is when compared to the conventional chromatography where we are talking about standard stagnant um, liquid film. So, you are going to have uh, different types of diffusions coming into picture which will slow down your process. Applications of membrane processes, theophilic membranes for the purification of monoclonal antibodies from cell culture, immobilized uh, helistidine and hollow fiber membranes for the separation of immunoglobin G from human serum, ion exchange membranes for the isolation of uh, antibacterial peptides from lactoferrin, cation exchange membranes for the purification of alpha viruses, anion exchange membranes for the adsorption of DNA and strong anion exchange membranes for reduction of endotoxin in a protein mixture. So, a lot of applications have been reported um, using membranes uh, for separations. Okay. So, different uh, uh, principles like ion exchange principle, ligand based principle uh, all have been exploited. So, membrane separation processes are used for separating mixtures by using thin barriers. Um, it is a synthetic material or it is a um, natural material. So, we are separating two immiscible fluids. The driving force in a membrane process is concentration gradient, pressure gradient. So, there is going to be a transport of one or more feed components. Okay. So, we looked at a large number of uh, membrane separation processes over the past few classes. Some of them have pores, fine pores, some of them do not have pores. Um, so, the process is like a diffusion, the processes which are based on pores is like a filtration. Okay. So, we have micro filtration which is almost exactly like your filtration, then we go to ultra filtration and nano filtration. Then we looked at reverse osmosis which is uh, trying to overcome the osmotic pressure. So, you are applying a large um, pressure, so that uh, the solvent uh, flows out pure. Then we looked at dialysis that means movement of ionic uh, material, ionic uh, proteins or ionic uh, salts. Electrodialysis where you are applying an electric field, so the cations and anions move to the respective electrodes. Again dialysis is used quite a lot in uh, um, artificial kidney for removing salts from blood and purifying blood and electrodialysis is used again for separating out salts from protein mixtures. Then we looked at per operation very ideal system for removing small quantities of water from a solvent or small quantities of solvent from an aqueous stream. Uh, it just uses nominal temperature and uh, vacuum. So, the energy consumption is very very low when compared to the normal distillation type of approach. And pervoporation is very good if you are talking about uh, temperature sensitive material. Then we looked at isoelectric. So, all proteins have an isoelectric pH at which uh, the protein the charge on the protein is 0. So, you make use of it and you separate um, proteins of different isoelectric pH using a pH gradient. Then we looked at membrane bioreactors. So, where you are combining extraction or removal or filtration of uh, the metabolites um, in a fermentation broth, but simultaneously carry on your fermentation. So, you are combining two things the fermentation or uh, uh, biotransformation with separation. Then you can also immobilize your enzyme on your membrane. So, um, you can again uh, get the advantages of the enzyme as well as you can get the advantages of the separation of the metabolite. This is very very good if you want to continuously remove your metabolite which could be toxic, which could be inhibiting. Uh, your bio, ma, bio catalyst or biomass or enzyme or okay. So, membrane bioreactors are extremely useful in that area. Then we looked at uh, membrane chromatography as against the conventional liquid phase chromatography where you have the um, ligands uh, 
covered by liquid. So, you are going to have the diffusion slowing down the entire process. So, diffusion times are much larger when compared here in a membrane chromatography the ligand is immobilized on the membrane surface. Um, so, the diffusion is are much faster. So, I can have um, ion exchange different types of uh, cation membranes, anion membranes and so on um, or ligand based membranes where I am uh, immobilizing an uh, active um, ligand on a membrane surface. So, we achieve very fast uh, diffusions, we achieve uh, um, very high separation rates, but membrane chromatography is of course, uh, is still in the early stages. Uh, whereas, if you look at uh, the filtrations like a micro ultra filtration is well established, reverse osmosis is also well established, um, dialysis electrodialysis is also well established, per operation is also well, well established. Um, isoelectric focusing is more in the lab scale, uh, membrane bioreactors are already in the market in uh, much uh, commercial scale. So, you see membranes have a tremendous uh, application and uh, use in uh, downstream where you are handling uh, small molecules, where you are handling uh, organic solvents, organic chemicals, where you are handling biological molecules like proteins or uh, enzymes. Okay. 